Boa tarde, pessoal. Nós vamos continuar agora com as atividades do simpósio. É, nós vamos ter a palestra da doutora Cheryl Donio. Uh, só um esclarecimento rápido. É, a gente teve uma pequena confusão. Essa não é a última palestra do dia. Após a palestra da Cheryl, nós vamos ter outra palestra, ok? Uh, a gente teve um pequeno problema técnico, a gente não conseguiu recuperar a câmera dela, então a gente vai, é, ela vai se apresentar sem a câmera, por enquanto. É, Cheryl, I will introduce you uh, for, our, uh, for the people. Uh, Dr. Cheryl Donio concluiu em 1997, bacharelado em Agricultural Systems and the Environment pela Universidade da Califórnia, no ano de 2000, se tornou mestre em Plant Protection and Pest Management, também pela Universidade da Califórnia. Se formou o PhD em Entomology, Systematics and Molecular and Morphological Taxonomy, pela Universidade da Califórnia, em 2007. Atualmente trabalha como especialista nacional em taxonomia de Tsanópera e Psiloide. Presta serviços de identificação pelos departamentos de agricultura dos Estados Unidos, Serviço de Inspeção de Saúde de Animais e Plantas, Proteção de Plantas e Quarentena e Programa de Saúde de Plantas. USDA, APHIS, PPQ, PHP. Também atua como curadora da, eh, das coleções nacionais de Tisanoptera e Psiloidea do National Museum of Natural History. Uh, então, eu vou deixar uh, agora com vocês ela que vai apresentar a palestra Tisanoptera. Needles in haystacks, inspections to decisions. It's Thank your... you. Okay. I, I assume you're ready for me? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I will first start to talk about the agency and what I do for the United States Department of Agriculture. And then I'll talk a little bit more about the importance of taxonomy with Thysanoptera and how that helps my agency do what we need to do. So uh, I've shown here a picture. If you think of how small thrips are, think of that as we walk through some of the commodities that we see um, coming into, at least through the United States, but I'm sure in Brazil you have just as many. So <clears throat> animal plant health Inspection Services has a mission, and that mission is to protect and promote U.S. agriculture health, uh, administer the Animal Welfare Act, and carry out wildlife damage management activities. Within this agency, there are six operational units, of which I belong to the Plant Protection and Quarantine Unit. That unit is responsible for safeguarding U.S. agriculture and natural resources against the entry, establishment, and spread of economically and environmentally significant pests and facilitates the safe trade of agricultural products. <laughs> to meet this mission, we must balance accuracy and efficiency utilizing technology, resources to, uh, technical resources to overcome challenges in mitigating pest risk. So as a mission, we have an organizational flowchart that includes stakeholders. And those stakeholders include field identification identifiers that help meet our miss mission by supporting our scientific uh, attributes and our regulatory um, uh, policies. We also have to evaluate pest risk um, as to mitigate pest pathways to mitigate as part of our policy. And in order to do all of that, we have systematics and how that affects all of the above. Um, without the information about the organism, we cannot assign any of that information to uh, help us meet our mission. So historically, USDA's focus was on intercepting and identifying interceptions at ports of entry, focusing on invasive species. And these two images are actually an inspector up at the top right and two area identifiers at the port of Nogales, Arizona, uh, as commodities come into Nogales, uh, from Nogales, Sonora, Mexico, into the United States. 
It was a small mom and pop operation. As you can see, the inspectors and uh, the cars are very limited in the amount that actually moved through the port of entry there in the 1940s. Today, our capabilities have significantly uh, exploded in the sense of being able to identify and look for pests in the number of, in with our increasing trade. Currently, we have the human power to inspect less than 1% of the imported commodities, baggage, and people transport vehicles. Now, I showed you a picture of Nogales, Arizona port of entry, and the center picture that you see here is San Ysidro, uh, California, where people are coming in from Mexico, and so are the trucks. The trucks are shown in the lower uh, part of that image. The, our, our borders are completely full of people coming back and forth. Um, so it's a daunting task if you think of that coupled with the cargo ships and the uh, personal yachts and the cargo planes and the trains and trucks. It's, it's quite a lot to think about. So how do we import commodities while safeguarding our agriculture, safeguarding our natural resources, facilitating trade, reducing pest risk, and maintain the increasing high level of imports and exports? Well, we focus on pathways, and that's really important because establishment of potential, establish, establishment potential of insects in new areas is extremely unpredictable. We cannot predict what effect an insect species will have on an ecosystem it invades. And I've put together this little graph here, as you can see, um, that allows you to understand a little bit of what we know from our history. So 2%, that's the blue bar, is ac accidentally introduced pests that become established after they've been introduced. The red is 65%, and that's 65% of the major insect pests accidentally introduced into the U.S. were not known as pests in their native region. So how can we actually predict that they would be pests here? And then animal and plant accidental introductions become pests, and that's the 10% green uh, piece of the pie. And then we have 23% that we know are pests. So that helps in trying to uh, mitigate cargo, but the rest is really unknown. So we really can't determine a pest risk based on uh, what we think comes in from another, another country, whether it's gonna be a pest or not. So what we try to do is follow major pest pathways fluctuations rather than focusing on only an individual of high profile or a high profile pest. So these are some of the pathways, nursery stock, plants for propagation as cargo, fruits and vegetables, uh, miscellaneous cargo like machinery or ceramic tiles, uh, international travelers carrying plant material, organism imports, so those live butterfly houses that you go to to visit with your family, uh, mail, that's a huge uh, uh, pathway. And then conveyances like ships, aircraft, and railroads. So gypsy moth comes to mind right off the bat because they lay their egg cases on the outside of ships. So inter insect interceptions um, are broken out here. We get about 61% from baggage, 31% from cargo, which is higher risk, about 73% from airport, 13% from land border and 9% from maritime. But even though the 31% is not the majority, it is uh, of higher risk because of the simple fact that pests are tougher to detect in a large cargo ship compared to a baggage or at the airport in, uh, in luggage. Ship to multiple sites, so you can offload a large ship at the cargo dock in, uh, in maritime, and then it's dispersed on 20 trucks. So it can be a daunting task to try and mitigate that cargo. There are large volumes that are infested. Uh, only about 2% are inspected by the Homeland Security Inspection, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. 
And then uh, we try to do risk-based sampling, but we can't do risk-based sampling unless we have some history of the commodity and the origin from which it comes from. So that combined with seasonal trends like high interception rates in May and December, May being Mother's Day and December being Christmas, and the pest group. So most of our interceptions, about 80%, are insects. They're easier to find in some areas. They're abundant. They survive transport and they're highly mobile. And then by intended uses, so we have consumption. So in other words, the plant is gonna be consumed in one way or another, or for propagation. Propagation is about 7%, but it's a much higher risk. And then we look at origin and we look at the origin by the amount of commodity we bring in. So this is showing from high to low. So Central and South America, all the way down to the Pacific Islands. And then you'll see larger ports also add in a different variation because if it's a larger port, there's a higher volume, a higher risk of uh, larger interceptions. And once the pathway is found as at risk, then we have to do some another analysis. We want to make sure that the interception is accurate. So we want to double check that, make sure that the commodities are accurate. And what kind of commodities? Are they uh, commingled commodities? So if the pest was found on an orange and it's in a shipment with apples, then you have to treat the whole shipment. So those are things that you have to consider. And you have to also consider um, how you're gonna deal with that kind of situation for uh, the pathway in the future. You may have to shut down the importation or you may have to put on a condition of entry treatment. So if it's gonna come in, it has to be treated in a certain way before it can actually come in. And then we have sort of like a backup plan for our domestic side where we have programs in place that do surveys to see if we have established invaded species. So, that's all fine and dandy. We are looking at efficiency and accuracy, and now we have to add in that third component, which is called timing. So efficiency in facilitating cargo, we wanna get cargo through the ports of entry as soon as possible without delay. Uh, we wanna make sure that our decisions are accurate and our identifications are accurate. And that's all because that commodity is perishable. It has a short shelf life. So it's a high pressure environment to be able to get an identification on something, make sure it's accurate, make sure it's facilitating the cargo and make sure that we're making the right decisions as far as treatment or mitigation. And we have to do it in a very short period of time. So we have a tiered infrastructure in order to do that. We have the Department of Homeland Security up in the top right hand uh, section of the circle they actually do the first primary, and I'll show you a little bit of that as we go forward. Then it goes to what we call an area identifier. They're co-located with those inspectors at the ports of entry who take on that uh, inspection process and actually do the identifications from the specimens that are pulled off the cargo by Department of Homeland Security. Now, if they can't make that identification, they can reach out to what we call a collateral tax taxonomist who is also at a port of entry, but may not be at their lo local level. They may be on the same time zone in the United States, but they can reach out to them for an assistance. If the identification cannot be made at that point in time, then that, that specimen is forwarded to the national taxonomic specialist like myself who puts a final determination on that specimen. And then that final determination is sent, not the specimen, but the determination is sent to the National Identification Services for them to make a decision on the cargo in order to facilitate it. Is that a pest that needs, that is a significant pest or is it a non-pest? All those decisions are made by our identification and then they make their policy statement. And that goes back to the um, port of entry, the inspectors and the identifiers so that they can facilitate that cargo. And it has to be done within two days at maximum because that cargo is perishable. So we're trying to make better decisions, more informed decisions. And now we're also including a molecular component to that. 
So we are developing tools that will help us in making uh, the accurate decision um, uh, in the future. Uh, but we are just, these are just baby steps. We're just getting started. So how do we process the high number of interceptions with efficiency and accuracy? And um, by doing this, we, we provide tools as national taxonomists. Um, we support the area identifier out in the field with new technology as much as we possibly can. We provide them with tools, either equipment or job aids that help them with a taxonomic identification skill. Uh, we provide them digital images and we request from them digital images, especially at this time where we cannot be, um, because of COVID, we cannot be in the lab all the time. Uh, the area identifiers are able to send us digital images that help us to help them make the identifications. And as I said before, we are working on molecular support, most of that being done in the background. Morphology will be our primary um, identification tool for, for the future. So primary inspections are done as that commodity comes in. So we have Department of Homeland Security. They are trained by our trainers to look for certain pests on certain commodities. Um, and I know this sounds great because for most of us, we're thinking, oh yeah, we're looking for a big butterfly or we're looking for um, a big beetle. Not always do we get the primary uh, way to identify something. A lot of times we get different life stages and we have to put an ID on it. So uh, generally speaking, the Homeland Security has a hand lens, a 10 by hand lens that they look for pests with. And those pests are put in an alcohol vial and are tagged with a piece of paper that shows the shipment and the commodity and the manifest information. That is processed and sent to the local area identifier who works for PPQ, Protection and Pest Management. This is a picture of two of them, one looking at diseases and another one looking at a pest insect. So the ports of entry are stationed all over the United States and we have area identifiers all over the United States to assist in, that, in this process. And I will say that the majority of the identifications are done by this secondary identification stage. These individuals are well-trained not only by us, but they have uh, you know, academic backgrounds in entomology and taxonomy that help them to make these decisions. Um, if they cannot make the decision and make an identification morphologically, or they're unsure of it, or if they've never seen it before, then this is where it's sent to the national specialist. And the national specialists are housed in two different areas. Well, depending, for entomology, they're housed in two different areas. Um, so the Sternorinka group at Acri and Thysanoptera are housed at Beltsville, Maryland, and the other organisms like butterflies and beetles are all at Washington, D.C. And we are housed with national special, with national museum. We're curators for the collection for the Smithsonian and um, we have the entire collection. Adriano and Elisan have seen, Guilherme has, have also seen this collection and been there to look at, at, uh, at the specimens in this collection. So how many specimens do we see a year? Uh, the national specialist for which uh, PPQ has 12, uh, we see about almost 18,000 specimens a year. That's pretty daunting. Uh, especially when you're thinking about, you know, divvying these up by different orders. Um, and that's just the interceptions that we see on cargo that's on hold. This does not include interceptions that are taken from luggage from people entering into this country or from yachts or from, oh gosh, the plane or the cargo ship on the exterior. Those are all mitigated a different way. But these are just the cargo that we're that is inspected and on hold until we make a decision and and mitigate that cargo. So, unfortunately, this is what we normally see, and I know you can all recognize this. Um, can anybody tell me what the top right hand picture is? 
And uh, Guilherme, if you'll tell me if somebody says anything, because I can't see any, any chat here. So this is a diaspitted. It's easily recognized, I know. Uh, the bottom right here is an octuid. And you all recognize this is a um, panquito thripanite. <laughs> and this is extremely obvious, I can tell you right now. Uh, it's an aphid, but uh, you really have to know your aphids in order to determine that. So most of those are guilty until proven innocent. In other words, in order to put an innocent uh, uh, mark on that insect, we have to know exactly what it is to know um, whether it is a pest at risk or whether it's, uh, you know, treated or destroyed based on the fact that we cannot know what it is. We don't know what it is. So as a precautionary, we take action against it. Uh, and then insect as a known pest, then it's an absolute uh, mitigation. We definitely take risk. I mean, we definitely mitigate that cargo with a treatment. So this is where the taxonomy is really, really important. We're the ones that give the foundational piece to pest risk. Uh, you won't know whether a beetle coming in is, is a, a pest risk or an insect of any kind is a risk until we know all of the primary information about taxonomy. It's classification, it's biology, the life stage, hosts, damage, disease vector, it's distribution, associated plants, the collection capture. All of this information is extremely important in evaluating a pest that's intercepted for its risk. So let's take a look at some of that information. Historical species descriptions and reclassification. These are just a few that I've, I've shown here. Uh, I think it's pretty information, it's pretty, pretty, inform, pretty interesting information. So Aelothrips microstriatus, it was found on flowers of an undetermined composite shrub. Is it a pest? Well, if it's found on flowers, hmm, maybe. But since we don't know what kind of flower it is and there's no other information about damage, we really don't know in anything more than that. So, you know, looking at some of these things, it's very interesting. So, Skirtothrips dorsalis, and many of us know what this, this pest has done. And it just shows that it was on castor and chili shoots. That doesn't give us any information about being a pest. So historically, the original descriptions may not provide us with the information. Do we need more information to evaluate pest risk? Of course we do. So as a taxonomist, uh, you know, in Thysanoptera, my main focus is to know everything there is to know about the Thysanoptera. I will not be Lawrence Mound, for those of you who know Lawrence, He's an extraordinary human being, <laughs> but I will be somebody who will know as much as I possibly can in my lifetime about the Thysanoptera. So one of the rules of thumb that I tell everybody, I don't care how much you know, is that even one thrips is always a thrips with an S. All right. So quite try to remember that. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of diversity. We need to know that diversity. What, what kind of information do we need to know about this? Um, What's the, what's the habitat for these guys? Uh, classification is extremely important. We need to know the relationships. In our case, Thysanoptera are related to the Hemiptera. Hemiptera are known plant feeders for the most part. Why wouldn't we want to have that information in the Thysanoptera? Suborders. Uh, it's really important to know the difference in these. Are there different... Uh, um, habitats that they belong to. Are they feeders of plants or are, not, are they not? I mean, these are very important information and it's extremely important as we place a name on a pest or a species that we have intercepted. The separation of the two suborders is very important as well. You'll notice here there's some characters on the left and then the, whether it fits the two suborders significantly. So articulated fringed wing cilia. I put this figure eight here. We'll talk about that in a minute. But it's not shown here in the tubulifera along with no, no wing veins. But yes, in the terebrancha. Uh, wing holding CD, because there's no structure in the wings, then the wings have to be held down so they're not blown off. 
uh, Terra Branch, there's no such thing. There's structure in those wings. So understanding what that purpose is is also extremely important. Uh, their position. Uh, the ovipositor is extremely important. So in this tube-like ovipositor, uh, it has a shoot. It actually lays the egg on top of the plant material. So in my mind, that's not going to cause any damage to a plant. So it, its risk of damaging plants is also limited. The terra branch, on the other hand, has this conical shaped saw-like ovipositor, and it actually walks along and then backs up and inserts the egg into the plant material. Ah, causing damage. Knowing this information is extremely important when we're assessing risk. So here's uh, the members and the family of the two suborders. And you'll notice that Thrypin A is highlighted here and there's a big number of 13 next to it. And I've circled it here because there's a secondary part of damage to these organisms. And that is they are virus vectors. Mouth parts are also a significant character, whether they are plant feeders on the bottom right, you'll see, or whether they're predators and plant feeders, uh, fungal feeders, spore feeders, uh, gall formers. These are all important factors. Also, for those of you who like to go to trivia parties, uh, this is great trivia. This is the only asymmetrical insect in the order. I mean, in the uh, in the in the order uh, of in the insecta of all, excuse me, uh, is this mandible over here is atrophied. So why? That's a question I'll leave you and we can talk about it later if you want, but it's a great trivia question. Morphological structures, I've shown here an SEM. This is just a really good picture of reticulation on the organism. We're constantly looking at a slide specimen that's squished between two pieces of glass and these are the characters we're actually looking at. So we're looking at that structure, where those CD are placed, what kind of sensoria on the antenna, um, how many uh, ocelli, and whether they have ocelli or not on the head. We have uh, some a side view, looking at the antenna, the head, and the, and the thorax, and the pronotum, and then the dorsal view as well, that structure that, uh, um, Reticulation and the placement of the CD is also very important to determine between species. Uh, unique morphological structure. So you'll see the sensoria here, which is basically uh, chemical sensory, and then uh, what we call a simple sensoria here on the antennal segment. Sometimes that's forked, sometimes it's simple, but sometimes there's non-existent. It's actually a circle around the antennal segment. All of these characters sometimes place them in a different family. This is a good image of the spiracle on the thorax, and you can see how it's sort of a, um, you know, a, a really great way to get rid of gas, exchange gas, and uh, um, that's a really good shot of the spiracle. And their structures are different between species as well. Remember, I talked about that figure eight in the in the terra branchia. They have the wing veins here, and then this is the posterior margin of the forewing. And you'll see here that this CD is in between the upper socket and the lower socket, and so is this one. But this CD is down in the lower part of the socket, and this one is up in the upper part. It's interesting on terra branchia because they actually use this comb shaped back here to curl up and kind of comb those CD into their place, depending on whether they want to stay on the plant material to feed or to fly. So shifting gears, if you will, uh, a structural component to the thys to the terra branchia that's pretty interesting. So body structures, host habitat relationships, all feed into our pest risk assessment. So whether they're tropical versus Mediterranean helps us with that identification on a commodity that's just come in. Host plant distribution, uh, whether it's, it's skipping a host or moving to a different host. Cropping systems, how long have we cult been cultivating agriculture? How long have we been uh, trading agriculture? Uh, insects have adapted to the agricultural change, 
which is extremely important to know. And trade has been a large part of the redistribution of insects and insect vector diseases. I talked a little bit about the viruses. This is from 2008, it really hasn't changed much, but there are the Tospo viruses in the middle, the species that have been known to vector them, and you'll notice that they're all in the same subfamily, Serpinae, which is very interesting. Tospo viruses and thrips have earned a very interesting relationship. So acquisition of the virus can only happen in the first and second, late first and second instar. Uh, they cannot transmit at that level. They have to go through a molting per, uh, process into an adulthood and as an adult can actually transmit the virus to uninfected plant material. However, as an adult, they cannot acquire the virus if they haven't acquired it as an immature. So this is a very unique cycle. There's a lot written on it, uh, a lot we still don't know, but it's a very interesting uh, cycle and um, evolution of the Tospovirus and thrips. They're haplodiploid. You'll see here on the picture on the right, that is an adult female and uh, the same species uh, adult male. So a lot of times we have to teach uh, the area identifiers in the field that just because you see this does not mean you have two species. So take a look. Um, we also have different kinds of toki throughout the um, uh, thrips and sometimes they change a little bit. Uh, so it's interesting how this is uh, developed in the Dysonoptera group. Species distribution. Uh, sometimes we have expansion. So a lot of times I'm always on some kind of meeting with the EPPO, your European Plant Protection Organization, so that I can understand and listen to things that are moving. Plus we have colleagues. I have colleagues in Brazil and um, in Australia and Mexico and Argentina. So uh, we can keep in contact with each other to talk about the movement of Thysanoptera. Whether it's, uh, whether it's moving with the trade or it's been introduced in some other way or not. So this distribution is extremely important to know uh, as we move forward in the future and we continue to expand our trade. What's the common host? Um, this is also very important. I've shown here very common uh, uh, commodities that we bring into the United States uh, that we're looking at every day. Seasonal information. So in this particular um, picture, I've shown uh, thrips fallout from uh, a ficus in San Diego after a freeze. So this is important information because if something comes in from California or comes up from Mexico in um, February, I'm going to say, hmm, no, it can't be this because they've already died out because of the freeze. These are important pieces of information. Seasonal information is also extremely important. You're going to see more Franklin AL Occidentalis coming in in March and April than you would say July. So again, keeping in mind the seasonal information, uh, knowing your commodities that are coming across is also extremely important. And feeding and egg laying damage is also important. As you're doing inspections and you see these little marks on, on plant material, you're gonna know that there's some problems and you wanna, you wanna know what those are. Um, if it's feeding damage from thrips, then you're gonna start looking for thrips in the commodity a little bit harder. Uh, fruit damage, you can see here, this is damage that has happened to some citrus and some wheat. Uh, in fact, you can see a larvae right underneath the calyx on this citrus as it's developing and another one out here and a couple more in there. They get, under there, they get in there at the flower feeding time right up here. And actually those are all larvae right there on the tips and um, start feeding away. And then you end up with this scar. And unfortunately, um, that gets juiced. So we may see that come in from time to time. Leaf and fruit damage due to Tospo virus and feeding damage. This is also very important. Um, uh, tobacco fields that have been decimated, tomato fields that I've seen just tilled under because of Tospo virus. 
So something to look for when we're looking at plant material coming in. Uh, believe it or not, I see these frequently coming in from Mexico and other countries where we have a larvae. You see the bottom right hand corner that has been uh, parasitized but not killed. So this is an oracema wasp. It actually parasitizes uh, larvae, ants, ant larvae, but occasionally thrips, uh, immatures will fall to the ground to molt and they will become associated with uh, the ant nests and will succumb to the oracema as well. So that's four immatures and they are very unique little wasps by laying their egg in there and then as the immature develops, it starts sclerotizing the skin of the thrip so it doesn't lose its liquid as they feed on it. So very interesting. And then of course we have the ant mimic up above. We also have uh, ectoparasites. So if I know this, I can tell the specialist in the hemiptera to look for parasitic thrips on the organism that we see here. Uh, that's an important uh, aspect to know if we're looking at uh, in, you know, hemiptera coming in on plant material as well. Aquatic thrips you see here, it's not necessarily that they live in the water, but they do live at the baseline of the water hyacinth. And these have been imported on, uh, on water, aquatic plants into the pet trade. Uh, through through the United States. So it's important to see this uh, as you come in and different avenues that you wouldn't think thrips would come in on. So systematics provides a valuable piece of information in regarding organisms in their specialty. Um, we assist in pest risk, developing and evaluating so that policy can be set in order to mitigate a cargo. Uh, we know what the distribution potential is we know that whether they're a vector or not of disease. Uh, we need to know their host or associated plant material, biological information, their life stage, creating damage, and the description of that damage. So I'll leave you with this small little Charles Schultz circa cartoon. As we walk through the woods, we can observe countless tiny insects. We can see ants, beetles, cutworms, thrips, mealybugs, all sorts of creatures. And then you can see Woodstocks and his friends are talking. No, Oliver, I've never seen a thrip trip. So if we have time, I'll take questions. But thank you very much for your, for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation, Cheryl. Uh, was, uh it was great uh, to hear uh, your presentation and the information you bring to us uh, make the this uh, meeting uh, a lot greater. And uh, it's very interesting to know how uh, taxonomy, identification, and the knowledge of uh, trips can uh, help to uh, make the the, uh, the health of people uh, safe and the economy too. Uh, we have some questions for you. Uh, oh, good. Uh, uh, and nobody uh, could make your challenge of uh, to spot the, the insects on the slides. <laughs> nobody can find what? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's start. Okay. Tudo bem, pessoal? Uh, gostaria de agradecer uh, vocês. Nós vamos começar com algumas perguntas agora. Uh, nós temos que pergunta de do Alex Rodrigues. Uh, uh, the, <laughs> Cheryl, you mentioned Central and South America as high risk input pathways to look out pests in the US. Uh, what kind of plants or fruits importation are considerably high risk from those areas? Uh, Alex, that's a very good question and thank you for asking. I just want to say that there it depends. Um, uh, we get more flowers in probably than other fruits and vegetables, and that's the highest that I can tell you that we receive. However, that being said, we do import a ton of bananas uh, and pineapple, and um, occasionally, uh, and we are getting a lot more chayote, 
which has been notoriously um, uh, a serious concern because it's been pretty uh, full of pests. So, it, but again, uh, when I say these things, this is not an always because we work with the countries and we talk to the countries and tell them, you know, we're receiving this and we have liaisons, if you will, who actually help their farmers to build a better uh, produce and to start to mitigate uh, pests being sent out of the country. So seasonally it changes, uh, annually it changes. And as we continue to work and have discussions with the countries that we import from, that changes. So it's an ongoing process. And, you know, while pineapple might be high this year and chayote might be high next year, maybe bananas is higher the next year after that. But it's a good question. But again, it's always it, it's always changing. Thank you, Cheryl. We have a question from Francisco. Uh, rejection of a cargo based on the presence of an unidentified, unidentified organism, precatory, that would be contrary to the phytosanitary agreement, which allows rejection by the presence of quarantine pest? Correct. I, I see what you're saying, but here's the issue. You cannot put a, a, a solid risk assessment based on a family. So if you cannot identify an organism past Thysanoptera or past Thripidae, you have to take the precautionary measure because you cannot, you cannot um, support its evidence or provide evidence that it is not a pest. Simply stating that it's in the Thripidae puts it in the family that has the highest number of agricultural pests in the Thysanopter group. So if you can't narrow it down to a family or a, um, a genus and a species, you can't say that it's a non-pest. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not contrary to the phytosanitary agreement. It is supportive of the phytosanitary agreement. So in other words, we have to be able to put a name on it to say, yes, it's a pest or no, it's not. If we can't, then we take the precautionary measure saying that it's possible that it's the pest. And, and, and I do see where it seems contradictory. Thank you, Cheryl, for your words. Uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, we have a few more and I will send to, uh, to email and we uh, will be open the, the answers for people on the YouTube channel. Okay. The next question is from our colleague, Manfred. Hi, Cheryl. How do you identify larvae? Are there collections you can compare instars of trips using morphological features, or is this mainly done using data of RFLP analysis? I think he's read a little bit of my uh, key with RFLP analysis, but thank you, Manfred, for the uh, question. We do have some uh, literature and recent uh, morphological characters that we can identify some larvae, not all. If you look at Franklinella, the genus Franklinella coming out of South America, that's pretty much, um, we've been able to tease apart a few, but we can't identify all. So what we know, we know. Um, when we have had issues, we've done some molecular work as a background. It's not been the RFLP. It has been uh, PCR. And we've been able to tease apart some more and actually get, at least get some markers for molecular work in the future. But again, we're just on those baby steps. Um, and it's an ongoing process because there are, are a lot of immature thrips that we receive and we can't identify them past um, maybe the subfamily, Thrypanae, which makes it much more difficult. It's a good question, though. I don't know that we'll ever have a morphological features for all the larvae, <laughs> but we can try. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, all right, Cheryl, um, 
maybe you want to uh, take some uh, parting words for the audience? Uh, I just want uh, to thank you for uh, the invitation. Yeah. And uh, if anybody ever wants to ask a question, I'm always available. Uh, Guilherme, Elisan, and Adriana all have my email address. Uh, also, uh, Guilherme, you will be sending me the questions so that I can answer them by email? Yes, I will oh. send you. Great. Thank you. And by the way, that's a very nice shirt you're wearing. Ah, wrong gift. Oh. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for attending our invitation uh, and be uh, talking here on the meeting. Uh, it's uh, always great to to hear uh, about uh, your uh, work with Trips, uh, of about your work on uh, USDA uh, to ensure the, the safety of uh, people's health. And thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Bye, and I hope to talk to you soon. Uh, we we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Right. Bye, bye bye. Muito obrigado a todos vocês que estão é, participando do simpósio. É, isso conclui uh, por enquanto a apresentação da Cheryl. É, nós teremos daqui a alguns minutos a próxima a palestra do dia às 18 horas. E uh, fiquem ligados. Uh, no, no canal para vocês continuarem acompanhando as palestras e no a aba também de, de discussões para a gente é, tá postando também é, resposta para algumas perguntas que podem eventualmente estar tá, é, acontecendo e deixando o tempo pouco justo e, e é isso fiquem ligados obrigado